video stream it says. So hopefully we're going to be live here in just a second. There we are. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> all right. Welcome everybody. It is Wednesday Wellness and I am Marisa Maggio Harrelson. So nice to have you here today. Thank you for being on Marisa's Total Wellbeing. And I'll tell you what, um, we are talking about how to create a safer world, right? And I have two amazing friends of mine that are going to share their insights. Um, you know, my heart is heavy. I don't know about you, but my heart is really heavy right now. I have um, Carrie Skirdla here and Tamara Blankenship. Um, Carrie is in North Scottsdale and Carrie, uh, I mean, Tamara is in North Scottsdale and Carrie is in the East Valley in the Gilbert Chandler area. Mm -hmm. And we've been friends for a long time. And these women are experts in human condition, in human existence, in relationship <laughs> resolution, in connection with people. They have psychology backgrounds. They have neuroscience backgrounds. They have um, their life. Carrie has a, her company is uh, Life Back. And it's really about empowering and changing people's worlds. And Carrie comes from a blended family. She has six children, four grandchildren, uh, married to a wonderful man, uh, Mike. And, and Tamara is also a mom raising beautiful children, conscientious human beings that we have here on this planet and we need more of. So I, as we were just talking last week casually, I'm like, we need to have a platform and, and everyone needs to be a platform. And I invite you all to just please share today, share this post to everyone you know, love and care about because we all need to come from a place of love and conscientious beings, being, you know, building community. We are all one. It doesn't matter the race. It doesn't matter the color, this, the age, the sex. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is that we are unified, right? So I'm on a platform right now, but I'm gonna let these girls take it away. <laughs> um, because, <laughs> you know, Carrie, let's go with you first because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not black. I'm not African-American. And, and I can only say what I love and how I feel, but I don't know how you feel. And I don't know how your children are feeling right now. Mm -hmm. And I wanna talk about that. And how can we mm -hmm. change this? How can we all get back together? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me on for this conversation. It's great to be with you and to be with Tamara. So, and if I look down, it's because on my <laughs> screen, Tamara is down there, right? <laughs> exactly. So, it's so great to be with both of you today and just the energy when I first came on, it, it's just amazing guys. Like I wish you were on here with us. So yes. hang on, I think this is gonna be good. Yes. Um, but to just <laughs> look back good. and answer your question, the things that are happening for me in my life um, um, and changing are, world. are exciting. Like this is exciting for me. Now it's not exciting to see the violence, to see people um, hurting, um, especially some of those people are my children. Um, you know, I took to Facebook a couple of weeks ago or a week ago because I um, and I was really inspired um, by a member of our family. Um, and uh, my daughter had a gun pointed at her the day that the um, protest started. And oh. she was just on her way to Flagstaff. She's a student there. She has an apartment there and her and some friends were just gonna go. And this um, one driver who happened to be a white male um, saw my daughter and he pointed a gun at her, right? and you know, my kids don't have the same kind of background that I did. I grew up with parents that were civil rights activists and, you know, just involved community leaders. And my, my children grew up in uh, Gilbert, Arizona, right? Just, mm -hmm. you know, and so it, it, it's tough to see your children experience heartbreak because that's what my daughter began to deal with was heartbreak. And I noticed when she came home, um, how different she was just like that. Here you are raising your children, trying to protect your children. And mm -hmm. in a moment, something happens. And now that person is just altered forever. And I saw that with yes. my daughter and, and she was being snarky and, 
you know, and quiet about it. And I went in to talk to her and I said, what's going on? And um, long story short, she ended up in my arms just crying mm. and me holding her until she went to sleep. And it's tough to hear your child say to you, mom, I am afraid all the time for my life and even more afraid for my brothers, right? Yes. So um, I, and she said, mom, what, what do we do? And I said, we keep breathing. That's what I've been doing all my life. Just keep breathing. So there's that, but why is there a, a, a variation between my experience of what's happening now and my daughter's? Well, for her, she doesn't have the practice in the background that I have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and why it's exciting for me is because I am someone that believes that the context of what we live in, our existence, our circumstances, um, and the events of our everyday lives has just expired, you know, and, and, and let me bring some clarity to that. Like when, when, when people thought that the earth was flat, they acted in compliance with that, right? If a captain was like sailing and he's getting too close to what they think is the edge of the earth, mutiny would happen on this ship. And it's like, turn this around so we can go back because we're going to go off the edge. And then when it was proven, what did that do? It gave us a new world, okay? Mm -hmm. And new things emerged out of that world, new civilizations. Human beings in the United States, okay, existing, let's just focus on black and white because there's more, more people here than just us, right? But we'll exactly. just give you that. Mm -hmm. The context in which we live and communicate and understand each other has expired. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here we are in our, our world still trying to work yeah. and raise families with an old context that has not <laughs> had enough dialogue, okay, to say, okay, that's the past. And Absolutely. this is why it keeps Absolutely. going. When we talk about the world is flat, that's what? A time in the past. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that was, you know, so great that they discovered that. We haven't gotten there yet with this whole black, white issue right? Mm -hmm. To say, mm -hmm. okay, we've had a conversation about it. That was our past. And that's over. If we're going to create a safer world, okay, mm -hmm. which I believe is a new world, then we need to begin to have conversation of creation. And that can only happen when we finally put the past to rest and say, that's expired. That's who we used to be. That's the making of history. And this is who we're going to be moving forward. Absolutely. I love that. Beautiful, beautiful concept that you use there. I think it's profound. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a great example. Thank you. Yes. She has really awesome credentials. So that was a huge compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> no, I love that. That was so, I mean, I feel that so accurately. And I, can I add something to what you're saying, if, you, if I may, because I, I really see there's a three, tri it's a trifecta effect going on right now. We've got the health, we've got our relationships, the way we connect and interact. We have our financial going on. All three are going on in this year of 2020, the vision year. This is all the rebirths of all these things that, like you said, the language we used to go by no longer works. It's outdated. Our education system needs to be updated. There's I'll so many started. things. Oh. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you and I can go off on a tangent on that one too. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> there is so much going on and we are focusing on all the things that are broken and not, not clear. I feel like we need to start focusing on the things that are working and how to re revamp some of these systems that are antiquated. Yeah. And we're having the wrong conversations, if you ask me. I think they need to have, they, they definitely need to be flushed out, these issues, 100% but what are we going to do about them? And I hear you saying the same thing I feel is, okay, we know that these are issues. We know that we all have different belief systems. We all know we have different, you know, past woundings and experiences and, and reactions to the way that we interact in our world. But what about what we want to do moving forward? What, this right. is only one part of the equation, right? So we're looking at the brink of, you know, our fear of her health. That's again, age, sex, gender, neutral. I mean, it is a threat across the board for everyone. I don't care if you're healthy or not. <laughs> you are at risk. And that's just, that's just the bottom line. And then we had this 
stage where we were quarantined for that, right? So perfect, perfect boiling pot, if you will, of just in, in the rocket fuel to create the kind of controversy we're having right now at this stage. The, the lack of ability to have connection, the, the lack of communication, it ignites these situations. And I don't, I don't personally don't see the difference between, I do believe our police officers need to be more educated and how to handle their own you know, behaviors, their own anger, their own issues that they have to deal with and how to protect all life, period, the end. It's, it's not about, it's, it's going back to their belief systems about what they took the oath of. Like when I took the oath, it was all about to be present and to be loving and no matter what my beliefs are, take my beliefs and set them aside, I have to be present to the other person, right? So we have to discern that component. These people need to be re-educated on how to manage their own personal stresses and belief systems. That's huge. And I feel like nobody's a winner in this situation. There's no victor in any of this. And we need to prepare now for the next assault. And the next assault is our financial state. If we don't get back to work, if we don't get back to working together as a community, we're going to have families on the street. We're going to have food, food issues, all kinds of struggles. And I feel like we're in the middle point right now and we need to change the way we're addressing these situations because we're about to all go down with this, you know, the way we treat each other, the, our health and now our financial structure. It, it all needs to be on the table. We can't just look at one facet, I think, but it's, it's important to address the individual issues that we're coming across, but how do we do it in a way that's constructive versus destructive? And that is what I feel like so grateful we have this space to have this discussion. I'd love to hear your, your, both your inputs on what you guys would like to see happen, you know, and how to navigate that differently. Absolutely. You know, I, I remember Carrie talking about Carrie, this uh, with her last week, and she said, if we do not get together and unite and let go of the past, we will all be, and I'm saying this, you're quoting the new black, we will all be the new black. Yeah. And there shouldn't be color. There should just be love. And, and what's happening is these people that are being like this, they being inhuman, not the human kind of human. Mm -hmm. What don't they have? What didn't they grow up with? Love. Empathy, compassion. Connection. Love. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the bottom line. I mean, I'm a yogi, but I'm, I'm not, you know, it is the truth. If we don't feel love and connection, that human connection and empathy, then we're in, we're in dire straits. But I'm, I like, Carrie, I love what you were saying is like, you're taking this, you're looking at this in the most positive way. Mm -hmm. And if we can get the anger out of people. So that's what I'd like to see. I would like to see the people say, oh my gosh, you know, the police, they, everybody needs an overhaul. Now I get it. There needs to be shift and change there. Absolutely. But you have to also look at what good is that they, they are also great people. They are. They risk Some of them lives. are family members. Yes. Yes. They, and I, they risk their lives every day and they do things. They are warriors. They are heroes. Yeah. It's the ones that aren't that make everybody look bad. And they and also, a blanket over it and we have yeah. how do we shift that how do we well, shift i also that think that the big accountability component is and i apologize for interrupting but we no. all need to look at what we are doing what are we doing to support them like there's there's more to this it's not we we're so codependent on our police being the ones to save us what are we doing to help support them too not 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 that we should minimize anything. I, to me, there's corruption in every system. We have to really break down the good from the, the dysfunctional. And how do we support the ones that are doing the right thing and doing, and I have a lot of issues with the, um, the standby, the, the people who are observing the wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. it, to me, why aren't people being more, they know right from wrong. They know how, but they don't wanna get involved. You know, heaven forbid they get involved, you know, like, what is that? That to me, that is an issue. Like your daughter, how, gosh, I can relate to your daughter so strongly because I actually had this happen in Chicago. I'm actually from Chicago. So I actually had that incident myself being a single, you know, a young lady in a car and some guy pulling out a gun, been there, been there a couple times in different ways, but <laughs> that situation, it changes your relationship and connection to other people because you never, they look like they're nice. They look like they're friendly. And then they do something that's so right. out of the spectrum of understanding right. and coping skills. You're like, what? Yeah. Like, it shuts you down and pulls you into your turtle shell. I totally. Well, 
it, it actually, Tamara, I needed to hop on there. Um, uh -huh, it, it actually pulls you over into what I was saying earlier, a new context of your life. Yes. And what's safe and what's not, who's safe and who's not. And yes. I really want everyone to understand how I'm using context. So I'm going to read this definition. Context, the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea and in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed, right? Yes. So when fully you're understood. Fully and understood. And so we got to really <laughs> emphasize that component. So the context that police officers go to work in, okay, is what needs to shift. Right. Right. Yes. See, there are psychological exams that they undergo. Um, very few of them say, hey, I'm coming um, on to the police force because I can't wait to shoot black people. That's not happening. But then the context that they exist in once they're on the force tells them that, okay, all black people are this and they're this and they're that, right? And now they can no longer distinguish fear from danger. And they're very, very different. You know, like if I'm in danger, my life is threatened, then yeah, I should defend myself. But the fear is coming from the context that's been shaped to them, for them. Exactly. And, and all of us have it. You know, I was looking at um, Dr. David Engelman is just one of my favorite um, mentors in neuroscience. I'm actually going to be attending a conference starting uh, this week with a group of neuroscientists. And we were looking at experiments, guys, of individuals of all ethnic, ethnicities sit down and if a white person was looking at a black person being stabbed in the hand, there was nothing happening in the brain because we had them wired. Nothing happening in the brain in the area of empathy at all. Isn't that amazing. And, and it's coming again from this context that we live in. You know, when, when you dig deeper and it's like, well, how come you didn't feel anything? The response from the white people is, well, you know, I don't know what they did. That is an inherited conversation about a group of people that has shaped something in them that has them hold back empathy because if they're black, they probably stole something they probably are selling drugs. They probably did something. And we have to have that conversation. We have to be give people the space to be raw about that. I don't like that the mouths of white people have, have been silenced because it kept us apart, all of this politically correct stuff. Don't say this. Don't say that. You got some sports coach that's excited about his new player and he stands on national television and he says, oh my gosh, this guy can run and jump so high and so fast. And it's like, he's born for it. And then the black community goes, oh, we're, we're doctors, we're lawyers. We can do more than run and jump and blah, blah, blah. And then here he is holding a press con conference, apologizing. What about the, praising the, the physiological fact that most Africans and African-Americans have extra pistons, an additional piston in their calf from when the the from the the time that we've evolved from being hunters and jumpers, right? So yeah, are we born for certain athletic things? Yeah, probably. And so that that's there's no reason to apologize for that. But yet those are the kind of clamps that have been put on the mouths of of people, and then it moves them into a new context. Absolutely. Right. I can't say this. I'm suppressed. That's why every why all of the white men were like, yeah, Trump, <laughs> you know, because it's like somebody doesn't care what they think. He's breaking us out of this context. Does, does that make sense? It goes because back. When you're suppressed in a context, Tamara. Now you're not expressed. Your opinion all of a sudden is shut down. And we need all people to be able to communicate so that we can move past that into a new world. Right. And I think it goes back to how we understand that it shouldn't be about anything other than qualifications, whether somebody applies for, say, a position at a job, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're Black, whether you're white, it doesn't really, why should that even be on the application? It should be a point blank of, are you qualified? Do you meet the expectations of the needs of the demand of the job? Yeah. Why should it matter if you're female or male? Why should it matter if you're 
these things are just so old and antiquated does not work for the system. So most old. qualified. Yes. yes. Yes, Tamara. So that's, 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 it, that's old. where, that's where I feel like this big issue really is birthed from, even whether right. you're, if you're older, if you're young, you know, like, why should that matter? You're qualified yeah. for the position. You know, it, it really, if you really, really look at it now, they're even starting to look at whether you're financially capable. They're looking at credit scores for jobs and what, when did this become a standard of empathy and understanding for whether someone's qualified to do a job or not? Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating thing to me. And I do see our structures getting weaker and not stronger in right. building us in our talents and our superpowers or our skills. Instead, we're like labeling and, and breaking down the structure even more by by quantifying each right. category into these stability or stable right. environments. It's not working. It's, it, not. it's alienating <laughs> us. It's labeling us. Yeah. It's isolating us. It's yeah. disconnecting us. Mm -hmm. We're doing, we're doing things backwards. We really are. But if you stay with that and marry what I'm saying, cause they really do fit so well they together. Do. Yes. Right. Yes. So here we are in this construct that no longer works. Yes. It's expired. And so if we go back to what I was saying earlier about the earth being flat, what yes. we're doing today is the equivalent of, oh, the earth, the earth is flat. So um, let's just build a bridge to the moon or <laughs> let's put some right? safety nets up underneath it. So when we fall off, we're caught and we can climb our way back up. That sounds Absolutely. so ridiculous, but that's what we're doing in this context. And we've got it like it's so... Um, like we're living such a modern life. I've lived long enough as, you know, a scientist and, and, and observer of humanity to see us become more and more primitive in what, what is just really packaged well. We look so great with our clothes and we've got our iPhones and all of our other stuff and, we, and our, and our, and so our true. Teslas. And we're just mm -hmm. looking so great and we're primitive. We're like a bunch of um, so true. We're like a so bunch of labeled by our, our possessions. Yeah. Yes, we're labeled by our possessions and observations versus the yes. deep connections. Yeah, yes. I totally agree with you. And I do think that that's the whole point. We're leaving this this heady generation of collection of things and knowledge to this beautiful world of feelings and emotions and connections. So I agree with you. It's definitely a huge paradigm shift and a huge directional change. The question is. How do we get everyone on board who's stuck still thinking in the needing to know category versus the needing to feel and understand and be empathetic and compassionate to all mankind? Let no everybody what. speak. Black, white, brown, yellow, red. Let everybody speak. I don't want to put a clamp on anybody's mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to be pushed into being politically correct around me. No, and I because get Because now I don't know how to respond to that and how to have it disappear. If you got, and, and here's a really good example. There's a um, man, he was so upset with me. Let's call him John. John was so upset with me. And every time he saw me, like he was triggered by something. And mm -hmm. to the point where I'm supposed to be doing some work with him and another doctor. And he tells him, like, I don't want anything to do with her. She is mean. Okay, Marisa's known me for eight years. I'm not mean. And she's mean, she's bossy, she's this. Everything he was describing was, was how you see Black women depicted in television, right? You know, and so I'm hearing this and I'm like, he just described a Queen Latifah character. And, <laughs> and, and I meant it. That's how it sounded to me. And I was like, Queen Latifah is not even it's that character, you know? And so we get on a call and, and I said, just tell me all of the stuff. Tell me everything that you want to say about me and say it to me. And he started to say these things when we spoke the other day, you said this, you said that, and you were just rude. And, and so I told him this, I said, you know, I always listen to feedback about myself. And I said, and I listen because I want to hear what's consistent because that's going to let me know. Okay. Yeah, I did that. I'm a jerk. Right. And I said, the things you're saying about me, I've never heard in my life. And, and so I think we need to look deeper, long, very long story short, it came down to him being bullied by one black girl when he was like nine years old. 
And, and that was never Point dealt with, but yeah. it created a context that he lived in that says black women are mean, bullies, bossy. Mm -hmm. And then he was all excited about working with Dr. Carrie Skirtla until he saw me. And then it was like, she's this, she's that. And, and I noticed the resistance, Tamara, that you were talking about earlier, like he was resistant to working with me and this and that. I had no idea what it was about. So once we had that conversation and, and I said this to him, I said, John, I am so sorry that that happened to you. And as a black woman, um, listening to someone that had that experience with another black person, I'm asking you with all of my heart to please forgive me. Please forgive us. And he burst into tears. See, we're unwilling to acknowledge that all people are hurting. This man was 68 years old and that happened 60 years ago. And that hurt is still in him. As a human being, I'm not okay with that, with anybody hurting. I don't care what the color exactly. of their skin is. Exactly. So I apologize for the pain that he had and it released a pain body that was keeping him blocked and away from me. I don't wanna be separated from him. I want to love him and I want him to love me. And I apologize and that freed him up. Now we never would have got that there if he had had a clamp on his mouth and now he can't speak because I'm gonna be offended and I'm gonna be out there <laughs> with a sign, okay? Like shut all white men's mouths, you know? I mean, it's like crazy how we overcorrect when it's time to correct. Let's just talk about it and, and be willing to be with whatever the other person is saying. Communication, and you're a specialist, Tamara, communication is a function of love. It is. It's a mm -hmm. function of love. And if we're not talking to each other, we're never going to return to love. And we will definitely all be the new Black. We will lose our freedoms. And more importantly, we will lose, lose what we can have with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I can't be moved hey. away from Marisa. Why? Because when I had nobody in my life and I'm going through major life transitions, divorce, menopause, <laughs> all that <laughs> was happening all at things. the same time. And I meet this beautiful creature. You mean to tell me I'm going to stand back and I'm going to have some idea about white people that doesn't fit the context, the experience that I've had with her. Mm -hmm. She saved my life. When I had no one, I had her, mm -hmm. right? That makes me her, her my sister. Exactly. And that's where I want the world to get. I feel like I totally resonate with what you're saying. And I also want to say one thing, like what I see, and I know you see this in your practice too, the, I call it the resistance. And you also, I love how you express it. I also see it's from our, per, our field of perspective, the things we've experienced over time make up our belief systems. We know this. It's not, it's not based on truth. It's just based on an experience of what you made up about an experience you had. Mm -hmm. So going and unwinding those takes a lot of empathy and compassion because we have a lot of shame and a lot of internal beliefs around things that happen in our lives. And we make up because a man did this or a woman did this or a, a person like this did this. And all of a sudden, that belief is, and this happens even with adults. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people think that this is just when you're a child, when you're an adult and you're raising a child and all of a sudden they become very unruly. We make up teams. Teens are hard to deal with. That's not true. It's just a lack of communication, a lack of empathy, a lack of, a lack of a voice, a lack of exposure and experience. We have to work through these things in a very empathetic, compassionate way. A great example of how you did that with a client, helping them bridge the confusion and unwinding their faulty beliefs, which is profoundly gorgeous. Yeah. But on a daily basis, we have to be in that and not take it personal. Every single thing that happens in our life is not happening to us, it's happening for us, right? It's to help us unwind all these wrong belief systems that we've formulated over time to be something that really aren't real. They're just thoughts yeah. that we have in our minds over time that we keep on revalidating by experiences. They're not real, they're just experiences opportunities. I always believe conflict is the missed opportunity for a deeper connection when you don't bridge the confusion. If you yeah. do not make amends around this confusion that you're having, you miss the opportunity. It's that simple. It's not yeah. them. It's not me. It's not, it's yeah. just a missed. It's like, like you said, it's a faulty belief invested on the world is flat. And all of a sudden we discover it's round. Now we have expansion. We have 
new opportunities. We have a new understanding. We have new places to meet, new exposures, new experiences. That's what we're missing. Right. We miss out on all of that right. just because of our narrow-minded thinking and our limited, restricted understanding of what is present. Yeah. All of it's a lie. It's, it's yeah. fascinating to me, you know, like thinking that the government controls this or that all, we have so many paradigms, so many belief systems going on that they're just, I call them public mantras because we say them over and over again, but we don't even know if they're true. They're, they're not based <laughs> on anything. Exactly. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't even origin. know. We don't. Yeah. We yeah. run around with these silly statements like, you know, only old men date young women because they want to rebound or what, you know, like whatever these stupid things we say over time. And most of them are based on this belief that someone gave us that we didn't even experience. Like a lot of the cultural experiences we have, we have to define whether those are our truths or not. And that's yeah. our opportunity. It has nothing to do with, like to me, when I meet someone, I look deep into the soul. I don't look at the canvas or the, the outer expression. Like a lot of people dress ritzy and they don't have two dimes to rub together. You cannot perceive a person. It's like, like they always say, looking at a book at the cover, making a judgment, whether it's a good book inside. You don't know till you crack open the book and expose yourself to the experience and identify it for yourself. All the way to the end. And to the very end. <laughs> not half yes. the book, all of it. Exactly. Right. And yeah. defining it based on what is, I have this, you may disagree and I'm just going to share this because I just feel like this is such a good thing to really look at. It's not whether things are right, wrong, good, or bad. It's whether it serves or it doesn't. And I've always had this belief that if it builds connection and deepens my life experience to expand my emotional range, to have sadness, to have joy, to just really make life juicy, then it serves. <clears throat> it, not all experiences are great. But some of them are so important to understand the things that you want in your life. You have to have the contrast. Mm -hmm. But if you live a life guarded, shaded, or, or protected, or interpreted by others, you're not living a life at all. You're living somebody yeah. else's life. And so you're you have to- fear. You're living a life You're of, living a life of fear, absolutely. Yeah. Guarded life that's sheltered from these restrictions of, of you know, you have yeah. to go out and live your life. You just have to. But and, there's two actions that have to happen and- there's the first realizing, I, I, because I don't believe that we would be where we are with what's happening um, with the George Floyd thing and, and the protest and all of that, had we not been a nation that was first slowed down by coronavirus. Exactly. That's exactly right? what I say. We would have just Absolutely. been like, oh, okay, I can't wait to get back to my latte, we, you know, or whatever. We right? needed this. We needed we, this. Right. This and is. and this, this to me is an opportunity. I hate hearing about anybody dying, Ugh. right? I do. Anyone. Anyone. And I yes. know people are getting hurt in this and people have lost their lives. And, and, but Children the other confused. side of this is, is that, okay, so there's the awakening that's happening. And the other side is now we have to elevate our thinking. We have to increase our vibration. And, you know, one of the things that I teach about a lot in my practice is the miracle frequency the love frequency, which is measurable. Neuro yes, yes. Neuroscientists can tell um, when you're in that gamma state, that theta state, okay, in your brain waves. And that's where we need to go. That's where we're going to form this new world, right? And the, the um, limitations that we've had in the Western world around understanding things like the anatomy of the spirit, which I believe is the chakra system, and the anatomy of the brain where our identity and our humanity merges with that. We have to sync up heart and mind yes. big time. I mean, my dissertation was based on the super conscious and how it wants to express love, how it wants to exist yes. in the world. And everything has been blocked out by this context that we live in in our heads that starts early in the K through 12 system separate yourself from the pack and win, win, win. I remember getting in trouble because I got up out of my chair in the third grade to go and help another girl after I was finished with my homework. And my teacher, Mrs. Farmer, I'll name her name because I'm sure she's dead now because I'm old. <laughs> and, and I remember her coming over and she spanked me because that's when they could still do that. It was the yep. 60s. I got spanked. 
Like, did you get spanked once? Oh, oh gosh, seriously? Right? seriously? Yeah. Oh yeah, Tamra. Yeah. Like, seriously, there was abuse <laughs> happening. I was. That I was, was seriously that. always. Yeah, that's that's that was that was not even abuse back then. That was the belief. It was of right. The time. You got disciplined, and then they that's... would you would go home, and your mother is like, "You got in trouble today," and then you're how could you do that? And then you're grounded. Exactly. <laughs> Right. And so, cause there you got to no know explaining, I hit your child today. And, and so right I just remember being paddled, spanked for helping someone else. Yep. And oh, for yeah. a long time, that was the last time that I did that. I was trained to separate myself and to win and let everybody else win for themselves. Right. And so that that has given us this this separation and this judgment that we have about one another while well, i made it or i worked hard people don't know what i went through to get here blah 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 do yours but we don't look at what is limiting people right and i talked about that last week how the systemic oppression of black people is not understood now it's a lot of black people that might be mad at me because I am of the impression that white people in the masses don't know that that's happening. Mm -hmm. So from the outside looking in, it's like, well, why are they doing that? Why are they selling drugs? Why are they burning up stuff? Why are they doing this? It looks odd, but if you understood that this is a people that have come up, they've come up in a broken education system, that's step one. My father used to always tell me, how do you make a slave, any slave, you withhold education. So the education system in black communities is broken and that makes them no low skill individuals. So then the industries that are in there, they're like, well, there's nobody to hire. It's no intellectual property. So they leave, they go to communities where they can hire people. That's why Chandler Gilbert thrives because of the companies that are here, but the companies are here because the academic levels of the residents here match it. And then once they leave, the grocery stores leave. And then the retails, there's no Target in black communities. There's no Starbucks there. Why? Because it's not our market. And then step three is let's bring in drugs. Let's bring in guns. Let's give them a dark industry. And then, you know, everybody's like, well, they got drugs. They got drugs. How did they get there? Who manufactured them? Who put them there? That's the question to ask. And then step four is let's subsidize the rest. You don't have to work. Here's your welfare. So now I got my check and I can go down to any liquor store because in an inner city black community, there's a liquor store in every corner and oddly a church. But that's a whole other conversation and I'll really, yeah. So, <laughs> so then all I have to do is cash my check, get a liquor bottle and go back home and make another baby for the government to take care of. And that is happening on about 10, 15 blocks in every black community. The cameras love to home in, hone in on that. They won't show my neighborhood. It's too affluent. You're going to show them to the rest of the world and create a, a separation and a context Okay, whereby now you're afraid of me and I'm mad at you. We have all been hoodwinked. And what happened while we were battling and, you know, all trying to get somewhere on the, on the American dream wheel, a whole lot of people got rich, keeping us separate and making us all their slaves because we work, 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 work to feed the supply chain that goes all the way up. And that's what we have to begin to, as a people look at and say, okay, the new world that we're living into, I'm gonna go higher in my thinking. I'm gonna be in the miracle state of mind. I'm gonna be in the love state of mind because these people don't exist in that. And that's where we win as a collective. That's where we win. And that's why I keep telling everybody love is our only chance for freedom, all of us. Amen to that, Carrie. I totally get this. Um, the love connection is huge. I, you know, we talk about yoga 
It is thousands and thousands of years old. Yoga is not a, an asana, a movement. Yoga is about life. It's about love and connection and and respect yes. for you, for all. We are a little blue dot, you guys, in this cosmos. The earth is this tiny little speck of nothing. And what's happened here with Corona, it has, yes, it's put a stop on this universe. It's gotten cleaner actually in some ways. And some of us can tap into the abundant part of it, meaning the, the life, like, like what is the good? How can I go inward more? How can I yeah. love more? How can I serve more, right? Those are the things that, that this is allowing us as the earth is clean, as the sky is blue, I'm like freaking out. I can see butterflies better now than I ever have. And it might sound a little frou-frou and hippie, but it's so not. So what? And love and connection, and we're all craving it. So we've all been put in this pressure cooker because there are people who crave human connection and we need the human connection. We can't always be six feet apart. I'm a hugger. This hmm. has been a huge challenge for me, you know, but if we are practicing love and connection and faith, whatever your faith is, uh, yoga, meditation, I'm going to do a chakra, um, a meditation today at 4 PM Pacific that is on zoom. And I'll be posting it on Wednesday wellness and you guys can join anybody in the world can join this limited supply, obviously, but you know, limited, <laughs> but it's, it's about just really tapping into the love, the vibration of love, which is yes. powerful. Yes. And it, th this is what begins the healing. So this pressure cooker that has exploded, this is what ha this happened, this unrest, this, this unrest has happened because it was a prime spot for someone to just explode for people to explode that mm -hmm. had not done the inner work that had not come from love and empathy. I don't have all the answers. I just, I just so respect this platform and I'm hoping others that are watching this or even on the replay, you know, use your voice and comment intelligently. Make a comment. How can you change this world? How can you all make this world a better place? Because we have to be unified. We have to come together here. We have to love our brothers and our sisters <laughs> regardless of orientation, regardless of anything. It's just, it's a perfect, I love, Carrie, you keep coming back to the positive of all this, where you could just stay dark. Your daughter's had a gun to her head since this at, at NAU in Flagstaff. You know, I know Morgan. I can't even imagine what that has done to her. She's lived in this beautiful life, her whole life. And all of a sudden she's experiencing things that she has never experienced. So it's a perfect spot for us all to shine our light and be more than light warriors. I mean, be love, right? Yeah, absolutely. And be loud with it. Be loud with it. Yeah. Love and, and have the strength to love. Because if you reject it once or twice and then you close off your heart, that doesn't work. And but I promise everybody that's listening, the more you take in the rejects, the rejection and the heartbreak and you come back in love. And I learned that um, from Dr. King, it's in his book, The Strength to Love. The more that you do that, the more your vibration goes up and you become a literal space of miracles and you will learn how to love like you've never loved before and you won't regret it. You won't, it's an amazing Absolutely. life. The journey to love is rough, but when you get there, it's amazing. I'd like to add one thing if I could. Yes. I'd like, I'd love to say at this moment that it's so important to be mindful of what you're dwelling on. If you're focusing on the dwelling of the resistance of things that aren't working, what is not, not feeling good, it, it will only stimulate more of that. So to be mindful of the fact that to be aware of the dwelling, go into the thinking mind, recognize that there's an opportunity here, something that you can take action on. If you can't, that, that may be the action is to actually be a witness and to observe and not add to the fire. That may be the action. The other thing is to really focus on contemplation, not things right, wrong, good, or bad, but to be an observer, a witness, because this is really what me, to me, love is all about witnessing. It's not adding, it's not taking away, it's not pushing and pulling, it's being empathetically compassionate mm -hmm. and observant. And to me, love, unconditional love, 
is accepting the differences and celebrating the possibility and bridging those two moments into connection. Really having empathy for the, the lost voice for so long for a whole culture of people who need to have a voice right now. Yeah. And to not withhold your voice, but to be empathetically compassionate to the voice being needed to be heard and say things like, yes, I understand. I wanna be here for you as you grow, as you go. And yes, you're right. A lot of the one culture has been focused mostly on the darkness, the things that don't work. But I love, there's a video that was put out just recently from a whole plethora of very powerful, you know, um, African-Americans that are changing the way they perceive life. And I'm actually gonna post that later on today if I can refine it. It is amazing and powerful to hear the educated mind. And I'm not talking about just white, black, it doesn't even matter. The educated mind being in connection to the heart, helping people feel a sense of purpose and connection. Cause that's what we all want. We want to be purposeful, have a fulfilled life and have value. So how are you doing? What are you doing to have fulfillment? Are you adding to the negativity and the contrast? Or are you living to the life that you came to live and be a contributor to the society to build, to build connection? to deepen this deep thing. I love what you're doing, Kara, to help build the confusion, to kill confusion, <laughs> to avoid having more conflict, but to actually be the light within the dark and have that opportunity. So it's a yeah. beautiful thing. Thank you for Thank you you. being that. Thank you both. This was powerful beyond measure, Power, more powerful than, I, I didn't know exactly how this would all go. <laughs> I knew it needed to be said and talked about. And you guys, if you love what you've just listened to, please share it with each and every person in your life. You know, I, I, I invite you to share it with 10 people today. You know, this is, this is what the world needs and your voice needs to be heard. Our voices need to be heard. Um, there's nothing in here that's, um, that's separate, yeah. right? It's all, it's all one and we are all one. So I invite you to take this time of the world that, that has slowed down on some levels and, and, and let it shine, you know, let this pressure cooker uh, explode with love and connection and, and truly being conscientious human beings. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Marisa. Thank, thank you, Tamara. Thank you for this space. Thank you, darling. Nice to meet you. Oh, thanks everybody for joining us on Marisa's Total Wellbeing for our Wednesday Wellness. This was this was beautiful.